people, I'm Shaggy, the opinionated hippie, living in a cold Texas, and I am, this is part 15 of what I hope is a never-ending series of Grateful Dead Dave's Picks, Dave's Picks Reviews. This is their sort of, uh, uh, what am I looking for, vault concert release series. Um, this is volume 15. I'm going to discuss volume 15, then I'm going to rank it as with the other 14 that have been previously released and reviewed. I will put that list up at the end of the video. And this is a complete show from April 22nd, 1978. We had the previous show, right? Or the show after this, the 24th, I guess that's after this, was released as Dave's Pick Volume 7. That's kind of toward the bottom of my list, though I, it's an enjoyable show, but again, it's a 78 show, so it just kind of falls beneath what are essentially a bunch of 77, 72, 73, and 74 shows so far. Um, and this is a pretty solid show, but I think it, in a way, it's your typical 78 set list with some absolutely stellar performances that rise it, raise it, rise it, raise it to a new level. But in comparison with everything else that's still released, it's still one of those I don't think I would recommend you seek out first. Um, again, uh, yeah, so what is it? Uh, first set is all on uh, the first CD. Um, you get opens up with a Bertha, pretty good Bertha, but this is the era of the Bertha into Good Lovin'. I'm not a fan of Good Lovin'. I don't like that song. I think it can rob, say, a Bertha of all its power, especially if I know, oh, it's 78, a Good Lovin's probably following this. Ooh, I wish they had played something else. Thoughts that run through my head. Um, it's a pretty good Good Lovin'. There's a really neat sort of the jam solo in the middle kind of has this extra little flavor to it, in which they feel like they're going to jam it a little more than they normally would. So that's pretty interesting. Um, but I don't know if it's enough to say what is a good lovin'. Um, Candyman is one of those Candyman, and I've said this before, that I, I want all the Candymans. Not Candyman, I only want one of them. I just want the same one over and over again. But this is one of those where it seems like the performance is not that sold by Jerry. He doesn't seem as invested into this as he should. And because it's one of those character-driven story songs, I think it works. I think like the attitude is, hey man, the candy man's back in town, man. I think I still got it. Come on, all you pretty women, I'm, I'm still around. It's not this defiance. It's not this like, hey dude, I'm here, you better hide, you better hide women, I'm coming for you, or you know, whatever the song's about. Um, it's one of those where like the narrator doesn't quite have the confidence or maybe he's getting old and he realizes this isn't for him anymore. Not because he wants to give it up, but because he just doesn't have it anymore. But by the end of the song, especially after what is a pretty interesting solo, um, the solo almost feels like Jerry's like dragging the song through the mud. And he's these great, just drawn out long notes that just go on. Um, it's like an angsty, almost like moaning type solo. But by the time Jerry works his way through the solo, the last verse starts to have some of that defiance where it's like, no, man, I do got it. I can still be the candy man. Um, and so it's one of those that starts off feeling like, ah, uh -huh, Jerry's not into it, but then he kind of comes around and it kind of works. Looks like rain, pretty solid Tennessee Jed. Tennessee Jet is one of the songs that I think kind of always surprises me and how much I enjoy it. It's another one of those. An absolutely fantastic Jack Straw. That closing solo jam in Jack Straw is one of those where I think it's both Jerry and Bob are just like coordinate like crazy and just trying to up the level as much as they can before they go back into the Jack Straw from Wichita part. Like it's got some really, really good middle of the first set energy. Like energy that you're like, wait a minute, this needs to go somewhere other than in the middle of the first set. This needs to start opening shows. Um, we're starting to see Jack Straw become that song. Um, Peggio, I will take all the Peggios in the world. I love this Peggio. Uh, there's a lot of them in this era, but I don't get sick of that song. Pretty solid new Minglewood blues and a deal, which is really, 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 really long on the, don't you let that deal go down. Don't, I think they just go over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And by the time they get to the end, it ends and Bob's like, we quit. See you later. And they walk off. They didn't quit. They actually came back for a second set. 
but it's a it's a good first set you know the energy is really good um the highlights are definitely i would say the songs if you like Candyman, if you like peggy o the jack straw i would recommend to everybody um, but it's a pretty solid first set second set Set two, disc two is the first half of the second set. Opens up with a Lazy Night Lightning Supplication. A song I've still yet to really figure out. Like, I get it. I know how it goes. But Lazy Lightning is a weird song. I think it definitely works better in the first set than it does as a second set opener. Supplication is a weird jam that I don't feel like they ever really figured out what to do with Supplication. I like it. I like how I like listening to them, trying to figure out what exactly to do with this weird little energy that Bob has sort of created for them to explore in. Um, again, I don't think it works as a second set opener. I think it's definitely a ladder first set type jam song, um, but it's pretty interesting. Um, we get a, it must've been the roses, um, an estimated profit, eyes of the world. The estimated profit is like a good healthy estimated and you get a good, three or four minutes of your typical estimated jamming, right? That's kind of like, kind of sparse and bare bones and a little jazzy, but then it just intensifies and gets really weird. And Jerry starts playing these really incredible, almost like Robert Fripp-ish notes. And the energy just like really intensifies and starts to build. And it's like, oh wow, this is almost becoming like a must hear estimated profit the way this, this jam goes. But then they just like, pull the plug on it, and Jerry immediately goes into one of those super fast, dun, 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 like one of these like eyes of the world that almost feels like they cannot get it together because everybody's trying to go with this super fast pace and they can't really get things to work. And it feels kind of awkward and uncomfortable and like a little bit like, oh, this, this is not right um, until they get to the lyrics. And once they get to the lyrics, everybody kind of finds like, you know, something to center their energy around. Um, and the solos are just ridiculous. It's just like Jerry just like going off. I mean, it's high energy. It definitely doesn't have sort of the uh, majestic sort of impact that I think the 73 and 74 versions have or even later versions would have. This really fast sort of almost cocaine fueled eyes of the world is just uncomfortable almost. It is so fast, but it, it's intriguing and it's it's worth listening to, but I don't think it... I think a lot of the eyes of the world from this era, because they're so fast, are just ultimately like curios. You know, I would never pick a, I mean, a 78 eyes of the world over a 73 or 74, or maybe even like a, a, late, a late 80s one, to be honest with you, 90s even. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting lesson. Then we get a 15 minute drums to end the second set. And then disc three is great, is the thing that lifts this, not much higher than up on the list because it's going to end up not being that high on the list. But it definitely makes it like, oh, this is almost a must here, this final disc three. We get a not fade away, good 11 plus minutes not fade away. It just has some really interesting jamming in it. The drummers are locked into that dun 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 to almost the entire time and they don't really abandon that and let the band go out to like these really far outside pastures as like 76 and 77 ones would but and it seems a little more tightly wound than those but jerry makes the most out of it keith makes the most out of it the band is feeling those grooves and working around the drummers and coming up with some amazing ideas and that goes in to what may be somebody's car alarm keeps going off and I wish they'd stop. Uh, that goes into what might be the best Wharf Rat ever. This Wharf Rat is a Wharf Rat for the ages. The vocal performance by Jerry, uh, Bob's support from all the way through, the absolutely ridiculous closing solo. It is just one of those solos that like every ounce of emotion that Jerry has been feeling the entire show is just poured out in this solo. And it is a wharf rat of the ages. And that goes in to a sugar magnolia that delivers on all the promise that the wharf rat set up. It is a sugar magnolia where like, this is why sugar magnolia exists. To take that wharf rat energy, jam out really hard before you even get to the sunshine daydream, and then just ride that sunshine daydream into the sunset daydream. Then we get a one more Saturday night for an encore. And that's what she wrote. So anyways, yeah. Disc three is great. The Not Fade Away, Warfrat, Sugar Mag, absolutely almost essential. Um, 
everything else is in, and the jack straw and the jack straw. Everything else you can find elsewhere. It's a good listen. It's not bad. Um, it definitely has its moments, but again, it has this sort of 78 malaise, just like laid over the entire thing where those really high moments are, are surprising. But anyways, it, it's pretty good. Like I enjoyed listening to it, but again, it, it's, it's something you come around to after you've heard a whole bunch of other stuff. Where would it fall on my list? Right there towards the bottom. I think it's a little bit better than that uh, 24th show, mainly because of that not fade away war frat sugar mag ending, which is pretty stupid, spectacular, and the jack straw, um, which is one of those sort of essential jack straws. So it's at the bottom of the list. But again, all of these are worth listening to. I just think if you're going to start with the best, start with number one and work your way down. But anyways, yeah, that's all I got, people. Thanks for watching. Um, subscribe, share, like, listen to music, leave comments below about the dead, about 1978, about your opinions if you check this show out and whether you think I got it right or wrong. You know, you know how comments work, people. So comment and make them work. But anyways, that's it. Thanks for watching. Uh, go listen to all the music you possibly can and stay warm, people. Stay warm.